Amen. He's more than enough for us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. We'd like to welcome all those that are watching online, and uh, thank you for logging on and uh, hanging out with us here for the next few moments. And uh, if you are uh, watching at home or uh, here in the building with us, turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7. Uh, we'll begin with verse number 12 tonight, uh, as uh, I've spent the last few days in prayer seeking God for direction for tonight. Um, I just uh, kept coming back to this, and so we're just going to dive in tonight. Amen? Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 7, and we'll begin with verse 12. How many love it when God confirms things to you? Yeah. Amen. How many don't, don't know what that means when God confirms something to you? I mean, I think we should all know what that means, but um, uh, got a call yesterday, uh, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, a ministry that covers us, and, uh, and uh, I was still kind of on the fence about this word tonight, and that, just, that phone call just kind of solidified some things, and so I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit's faithful, amen? amen. All right. See if I can get through this without choking. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12. If you have it, say amen. amen. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night. And he said to Solomon, I have heard your prayer. And I have chosen for myself in this place a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or when I command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence on my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers of this place. So now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name will be there continually. My eyes and my heart will be there for all days. Somebody say amen. amen. When God chooses a house. When God chooses a house. Revival needs to be understood because... For some, revival is a series of days and meetings where you have guest speakers and there's different things happening. Uh, but I, I don't refer to those as revivals. I refer to those as special meetings. I refer to those as conferences. I refer to those by a lot of different titles, but I, I don't like to call them revival uh, because revival is not an event. Revival is not a conference. Revival is not, does not mean a guest speaker. Revival does not mean the things that we've kind of turned it into meaning. Revival is an atmosphere. Revival is activity. Revival is, quite frankly, God moving in the midst of His people, right? So revival is not an event. Revival is a culture. It is, it, is, it is something that is supposed to mark the house that God chooses. The word revive just simply means to return to life. To return to life. How many need to be revived? Amen. The more you watch the media, the more, not all media, uh, but you know some media, uh, you will definitely need to be returned to life. So when I say revival is our culture, what I'm saying is, it is the act of God to revive His people, to return them to life. Church, if, it, if, if a church is a house that God has chosen for Himself, it ought not be cold, dead, dry, and indifferent. I'm going to try to sit because I need to sit. But it, it should not be cold, dead, dry, and indifferent. We should not leave the same way we came in. If God has chosen the house, if God has chosen the house, it ought to be 
uh, an exciting culture. It ought to be an enthusiastic culture. It ought to be a culture where you walk in, and it's not just that you know that God is in that place. You feel God in that place. There's an anointing on the worship. There's an anointing on the message. There's an anointing on every prayer when revival is our culture. Revival will change and impact. Now I want to give you a list of things that I believe revival changes and revival has an impact on. First and foremost, revival has an impact on the individual. Our church will not have revival if we as individuals do not have revival. Right? Revival, uh, do you remember that old song, Lord, send a revival and let it start with me? Some of y'all know that song? Because revival doesn't start, hear me now, revival doesn't start with who's speaking or who's singing or who's doing drama or all these other things that we've turned it into being. Revival starts with the life of the individual. When we as individuals are on fire for God and then we come together and our fire begins to spill out on other fire, that's when revival breaks out in a house. But if we're not having revival in our homes, in our car, on our job, you know, at the grocery store, wherever you want to fill in the blank there, revival starts with the individual. Secondly, revival has to have a change and impact on the home. Where the spirit of rebellion does not have any, any welcome there, right? Where strife is not there, where bickering is not there. Revival has to be the culture of our homes. Thirdly, revival will have a change and impact on the family. On the family unit, I think without getting into a political discussion, we all realize that the enemy has targeted the family unit in the, in the time that we're living in. So revival will have a change and impact on our families. Fourthly, revival has a change and impact on our community. But listen, it doesn't start with our community, with our region, or with the nation. Some of us are crying out for God to send revival to America when our cry should be, God, send revival to me. See, the, what this list, this list uh, is a lot like peeling an onion. Revival in the nation is the outer skin. Revival in a region is the outer layers. Revival in a community is the inner layers, right? Right? Revival in the family, revival in the home is getting to the interior of that onion, but at the core of that onion, at the very center of that is the revival in the individual. So our cry should not be, God send revival to this nation. Our first cry is, God send revival to me. Let me burn. Let me get set on fire. Because if I get set on fire, my family's going to get set on fire. My home's going to get set on fire. And if my home is set on fire, and if the people I go to church with, if their homes are set on fire, our church is going to be set on fire. It's hard, watch this, for a community to be on fire for God if the church isn't on fire for God. It doesn't start with what's going on out there. It starts with what's going on in here. Right? If we'll get revival, this church will have revival, and that's why I'm here. Amen. That's why God sent us here, to birth this thing. Because if our church can have revival, State Road NN can have revival. 54 Business can have revival. On to the outer parts of Fulton and Callaway County will have revival. But we've got to get set on fire for ourselves. And being full of revival simply means we don't settle for anything less than what revival is. And then if our community will get set on fire, then we can turn this whole region upside down. And if we can turn the region upside down, if we can get the region on fire for God, we can turn this nation around. It doesn't start with politics. It starts with prayer. The church needs a voice in politics. Who you vote for matters. Hear me. Who you vote for matters. But that is not. Revival doesn't start in the White House. Revival starts in our house. Amen. How many want revival? I mean, I know I do. I don't need you tonight. Okay. It's hard to talk about revival and keep my seat. Okay. Look, Smith Wigglesworth, you know I love him. Smith Wigglesworth said this. 
He said, if nobody else wants to be on fire for God, then just stand there and burn and let everybody watch. What he meant by that was, stop waiting for somebody else to get on fire before you get on fire. Just burn. Amen? Come on, say it with me. Burn, baby, burn. (laughs) Amen. So, we're talking about what happens when God chooses a house. I wish my wife was here tonight because I would pick on her because she loves Love It or List It and all those home shows and we're looking to buy a home next year so hopefully uh, you know God will lead us to the right place but uh, you know whenever you talk about choosing a home everybody has the first thing I'm going to talk about requirements so what are God's requirements you know, when we were looking at, at a house before the new housing laws for COVID-19 struck us, we had a list. Our list were, some of it was requirements, some of it was preferences. So I don't want to talk about preference, I want to talk about requirements. God has requirements in order to choose a house. Okay, God has, now when I talk about when God, I'm not talking about, well, every church God has chosen for it to be his house. Well, he's not preached in every church. So he's not in every church. And I'm not going to get criticized for that statement, but I stand by that statement. Because I've been in some houses where he did not choose to place his name there. Amen. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to keep on moving forward. Amen. So what are God's requirements? You know, when my wife and I were looking, you know, we had some requirements. You know, we at least three bedrooms. We're really looking for four. Uh, finished basement because we got a bunch of kids and we got a dog and a fenced in yard because my wife sometimes just needs the dog out the house and and different things like that i have some requirements i need a large deck or a lot or large patio because of all my barbecue equipment and i'm not looking to get rid of any so everybody's got requirements right my wife my wife wants to make sure she has an island and, and, and that might not mean anything to you, but for my wife, you know, it's all about space. And so, uh, what are God's requirements for choosing a house? And so, He lists for us in verse 14 what God looks for when He chooses a house. Number one, the first requirement is that it's got to be an if my people atmosphere. What do I mean by that? If, that word if, is the entire promise of what God says in these verses hangs on that word. If. It it will not just happen because God said it would happen. There's a prerequisite for it to happen. And that is, you have to understand that you are His people. You are His people. He says, if my people. In other words, I am His and He is mine. I belong to God, God belongs to me. Understanding that before I get into any part of what this word has to deal with, I first have to understand I belong to God. I am His possession. I belong to Him. I am His son. You are His son. You are His daughter. We are children of the King. And He, asks, and he says, I'm going to give you a promise here in a few moments, and I'm going to give you the, what the promise God made, but the promise hinges on the reality of us coming to know who we are. Amen. Secondly, God's second requirement is, number one, you've got to know who I am, and then secondly, I don't need you just to know who you are, I need you to walk in humility. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. John the Baptist said this, I must decrease so that he can increase. That is humility. I'm going to say it this way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. What do I mean by that? It is not humility to say, well, I'm nothing. I'm unworthy. Uh, I'm the scum of the earth. I'm just dirt. I'm a vile sinner. That does not help anybody walk in revival. Because the reality is, that's not humility. That is having an unbiblical self-perception. Because my Bible says, I've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. 
My Bible says I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that have been called out and called in. And so it is not that I think less of who I am, it is that I think of myself, my wants, my desires, my preferences less. What I want for God to do must bow its knee at what God wants to do. Newsflash, you and God won't always be on the same page. Less of me, more of him. That is a requirement for God to choose a house, is, is humility. I have, to, I have to, I want you to write this down. I have to sacrifice my wants on the altar of his will. I have to sacrifice my wants on the altar of his will. That's humility. Not, Jesus said this, not my will but yours be done. When did he say that? He, did, he said that when he was struggling in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Father, if it's possible, I, I hear it this way, kind of, hey, hey, Dad, <laughs> let's revisit this for a second. And if it's possible that I don't actually have to go through with this, that's what he said. Let it pass. There's got to be another way. Hey, you know, they're about to drive spikes into my flesh. Is there another way we can do this thing? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's humility. Jesus didn't view himself less. He didn't view himself unworthy because if he wasn't worthy, he could have never been the one on the cross. It's not thinking less of yourself. We need to have a proper biblical self-perception. Humility. Number three. Now he says this, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and and seek my face. The third thing God looks for, number one, do they know who they are? Number two, are they humble? Then number three, are they praying? Are they praying? It is important that we be a praying church. A praying church is a growing church. A praying church is an on fire church. A praying church is a vibrant church. Amen? Amen. Not just praying individually, but praying corporately like we've been doing on Sunday night. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Psalms 107. Psalms 107 in verse 6 and verse 13 and verse 19 and verse 28. It all says the same thing in talking about Israel. It has this testimony. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their COVID. No, out of their distresses, right? And that can mean a whole bunch of things for a whole bunch of different people. But the reality is, is that when the Israelites prayed, God delivered. When you pray, God delivers. When you pray, God heals. When you pray, God sets free. Amen? He said, if you will pray and seek my face. If you will seek my face. He's calling us to seek his face, not his hands. We don't have to seek his face, his hands, because once we get his face, we get what's in his hands. You know, it's like when I would go on a trip and uh, away from my family and I'd come home and, uh, you know, if I walk through the door and my kids run up to me and say, Daddy, I love you. I missed you. That is that is received differently than running up to me and say, Daddy, would you buy me? What'd you get me? And that's what we've turned prayer into. God, I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. I need this for my family. I need that for my family. I need this for my mind and this for my body and this for my finances. And I know you can do it, God, so do it, God. Do it, God. We've turned prayer into treating God like Santa Claus. We're not there for him. We're there for for what's in his toy sack. Amen? But that's not, what God, that's not what he's saying. He said, when I'm looking to choose a house, I'm looking for people that are after my heart, after my face, after my presence, not after my presence. After my presence, C-E, not after my presence, T-S. God is after, he's after a people that are in love with him, not in love with his stuff. Amen? So he says, pray. I got a call from a ministry that covers us this week. And uh, I forget what day it was now, all my days are running together. But they said, you know, we're, we're starting a brand new prayer initiative. Uh, and we're looking for 100,000 churches and, and church members to join with us uh, as we launch this initiative. And we want to know, will you be a part of this? And I said, what's, what's the initiative? I think you need to ask that question. And so they said, well, 
uh, you know, uh, our, our pastor, the, the head over this whole organization, has told uh, us that God told him to gather the church throughout America to seek God on behalf of the election and on behalf of sending revival to the church. And I said, really? I'm like, yeah, count me in. They said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, we've been doing that for a month. Amen. He said, what? I said, I said, over a month ago, I called my church and we told them, God is calling us on Sunday nights to come together to pray for this election and to seek God to send revival to America. And it starts with us. And he said, well, that's exactly what pastor's been saying. I said, I know we cut from the same cloth. I said, and you need to know, and I didn't say this rude. I didn't, trust me, I didn't say it rude. I said it very, with as much humility as I could. I said, listen, I said, he's not the only one hearing from God on this thing. I said, anybody that has their ear to the voice of the Holy Spirit is hearing the same things. And so they're sending us some booklets that we're going to give to our leaders and our, and, uh, our prayer team. Uh, and hopefully we can get more, but we're starting with that. Uh, and, uh, and, and they said, well, we, because of everything that's going on, we want to sow these booklets into you. And I said, well, send them on out. Amen. And so the point is, is that that's what God is saying, is, is he will not choose a house for himself that is a house that doesn't pray. Amen. And if you don't pray by yourself, you can't pray with other people. Amen. You know, I used to do that, not pray by myself and then go to prayer meetings, and somebody looked to me to pray, and I would say, I was a kid, and I would say, uh, you pray, I'll agree. That's lazy, isn't it? You do the talking, you do the praying, I'll just say amen. Yes, God. And you can look real spiritual doing that. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. Hey, yeah. That's lazy. Open your mouth and pray, amen? All right, nobody here is like me, I guess. All right. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24, before you call, I will answer, and while you're yet speaking, I will hear. Before you call, I will That's why he said, I, well, I'm going to choose a house that's full of people that pray, because he said he would, that he would answer. Even, the, do you understand that? The Bible says before you even open your mouth to ask, he already says yes. He already sends the answer. Amen. Pray. Somebody say, let's pray. let's pray. Amen. But he says this. Now, the fourth requirement. He's not just looking for people that know who they are in him. They're not just looking for humility and not even just looking for prayer warriors. He's also looking for a house that's full of people that are willing to turn from our wickedness. That will turn from our wicked ways and i know there's nobody in here that has any wicked ways so you just you know think about somebody else but you can you can have all of the marketing you want you can have the greatest worship team you want you can have the best speaker it doesn't matter if we are people that are not turning from wickedness people that are not turning from wickedness. what does it mean to turn it means to abandon forsake or give up that there's something in each and every person that God is calling to turn away from something. Well, if they know, it's not about they. We've got to look at the man in the mirror. We've got to, we've got to take a long gaze at God, show me, show me what you want different in me. Show me what you want, to, want me to change and be willing to abandon, forsake, and give it up. Amen. When these requirements are met, then the Bible says that God doesn't just have a requirement, God has a response. The first thing God will do when He finds a house like this is He said, I'll hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. You are yet to pray the prayer that God cannot, has not, or will not answer. His ears and His arms are open to us. And we have that promise that if we understand we are His people and if we will humble ourselves and if we will pray and seek God's face and turn from our wickedness, then the first thing He says is, I'm going to hear you. I'm going to hear you. Well, Pastor, doesn't God hear all of our prayers? The Bible says that husbands ought to love their wives 
as Christ loved the church so that their prayers are not hindered. Now, this isn't a marriage seminar, so I'm going to leave that one alone, but I'm just going to say that there is a difference between praying and praying effectively. And he said, I will hear from heaven. Somebody say amen to that. The second promise we have, God's response is not only will I hear from heaven, but I'll forgive your sin. God is abundant in grace and mercy. (coughs) He forgives. (coughs) He restores and He renews. Aren't you thankful for that? God's response is, yeah, when I find a house where the people are humbling themselves and praying and turning from their wickedness, I will hear them, but I'm not going to stop at hearing them. I'm going to forgive them. So sometimes the prayer of of forgiveness that we need to offer unto God is on behalf of ourselves or our families. Sometimes God calls a church to rise up and ask for forgiveness on behalf of the community, on behalf of the state, on behalf of the nation. That God, we failed you. God, we have abandoned you. God, we've turned our back on you. God, we have turned to lawlessness. God, we've turned to all these things that are not according to your word. So God, forgive us as a nation. And God said, I'll forgive your sin. And then thirdly, and I think what we can all agree that we need God to do so desperately, is he said, I'll heal the land. My prayer is that God will heal our land of division. That He will heal our land of hurts and wounds. That He will birth revival. When God births revival, it will bring healing to the land. It will bring healing to the community. It will bring healing to the church. It will bring healing to the individual. When God responds. And I believe He's responding, don't you? Uh, Some of the things God was doing Sunday morning, God was responding because I believe God has found a house that he can place his name here. Amen. Amen. Don't you agree with that? Amen. Amen. And it's going, as my grandmama used to say, it's going to get gooder and gooder. Amen. She used to say this all the time. My, my grand, you met my mama. She's my grandmother, you know, 2.0. Because my grandmother, she's 4 foot 11. I remember when I was finally taller than her, like at 10. And I thought I was huge. Then I realized, Man, she's the smallest one in the room in every room. It doesn't matter where we go. <laughs> she's four foot eleven and full of the Holy Ghost. I mean to tell you, on Saturday she used to take me out. You know, this was before you had generations that just lost themselves in a screen. She would take me at eight, nine years old to Food Lion, our little grocery store there in Akoi, Florida. And she would take me there on a Saturday and she would say, you're coming with me today. And I'd be like, say what? Like, I just want to watch cartoons and play basketball. And she goes, no, you're coming with me today. And she'd take me on down there to, to Food Lion or Winn-Dixie or wherever. And she would set up a table because she was also a nurse, a registered nurse. And she would set up a table for free blood pressure screening. It was a, it was a ruse. She wasn't there. She, she was there to, to screen for the blood, but it wasn't your blood. Amen. And so she would sit there and she would, she would offer to, to check your blood pressure. She would have books and books of coupons for that grocery store. And then while, see, she was smart because while she would put that cuff on their arm and she would be squeezing all her squeeze and would get slower and slower. Well, well, praise God. I'm so glad you came in today. And she would just start telling them about Jesus, man. And she used to say this all the time. You know, she would lead somebody, I would watch her, she'd lead somebody to the Lord at, at that little coupon table. And then, and then they would get, they'd get born again. They, then they'd go get their groceries. And then she, she would just start getting all excited. Whoa, I'm telling you, there's no thrill like it. There's no thrill like it. And I said, Real, I said, what is going on here? I thought we were here to pass out coupons. And she goes, she goes, oh no. She goes, we're here for God. She goes, and I'm telling you, she goes, sometimes, Sometimes, I'll never forget this, I was about eight years old, she looked me in my, my face and she says, sometimes, son, it's better felt than telt. <laughs> when God births a revival, what, it's better felt than tell, right? What, what is happening in you, what's happening to you, what's happening through you is going to be so great because it is God healing our land. Now, 
God does not just have requirements and God does not just have a response. God has a commitment. God's commitment is found in this passage and that He says that when you do this and when He responds to us, then He says five things. Number one, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to your prayer. That's powerful right there. My eyes, he said, when I find a house that meets my requirements and I respond to them, then I am choosing to place my name there. Go back to verse 12. Look at this together. In verse 12, the Bible says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I've heard your prayer, and I have chosen for myself in this place for this house to be a house of sacrifice. In other words, what God said is, I've chosen this house and I'm going to place my name here. That this is now he's telling Solomon, this is not Solomon's temple. This is Jehovah God Almighty's temple. Because in this place, I, my eyes will be open to what's going on and my ears will be attentive to your prayer. Number two, then he says, and my name will be there forever. My name. That's why I say we do not come into this place to invite God in. He has invited us in. Why? Because His name is here. The name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that He is Lord. The Bible says that every knee in heaven, on the earth, and my favorite, under the earth, must bow at the mention of His name. Every tongue in heaven, on earth, and under the earth must confess that he is Lord. My name will be there. Number three, my eyes will be there. Number four, my heart will be there. That he tells Solomon, and what he told Solomon, he's telling us that as God said, I've chosen this place for my name to be here, for my ears to be open, for my eyes to be open, to be attentive to the prayers offered in this place. So I believe God is telling us, Victory Fellowship, my name I'm putting on this place. My eyes are open. My ears are attentive. And I'm hearing your prayer. I'm forgiving your sin. I'm healing your land. You know, I still talk to people. I still have people talk to me about what went down last year. And I don't want to be rude. But I don't give two rusty pennies about what went down last year. I only care about what's happening right now in this moment. And it doesn't matter what happened. It matters what's happening. Come on, somebody shout amen. Amen. My name will be there. My eyes will be there. My heart will be there. And then the last thing I want to tell us tonight is simply this. He says that this will happen perpetually do you understand what that word means that means to never end it's it's like summer in florida it's perpetual (laughs) serious it's perpetual we have four seasons in florida hot hotter hottest in god please rapture us i felt that way this summer here just for a couple weeks Amen. Perpetually, continually, forever. Once God chooses a house, His intent is for His name to always be there. His intent is for His presence to always be there. His intent is for His glory to always be there. And so my prayer tonight is that God, when He looks at this house, He will see that this is a house of people called by His name. We're humbling ourselves and we're praying and we're seeking His face and we're turning from our wickedness because we want God to hear. We want God to answer. We want God to forgive. And we want God to heal. Can you agree with that tonight? Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise tonight. So, My intent tonight, (laughs) for those that are here and those that are watching, was to close tonight 
asking God to send revival to our nation. But now that we are here together in the presence of God, I believe our first prayer is the prayer of repentance. That God will forgive our nation as He forgives us. There isn't anybody in here that doesn't have a need for repentance. Repentance is not a one-time event that you do at an altar so that you can get saved. Repentance needs to be a lifestyle. My father always used to say to me, son, keep short accounts. Keep short accounts with the Lord. When you mess up, ask for forgiveness. Even though God understands and knows your heart and can see every circumstance, keep short accounts. Don't let the sun go down without asking God to forgive you. I think that can sometimes, we can take that too far and almost, you know, get under condemnation with it once in a while. But the point is, is to, for us to keep short accounts with God. And listen, before we can cry out for God to send revival to the nation, He needs to send revival to us. Amen. And not us, and I'm not naming our church, I'm talking about us as individuals. That God will send revival to individual lives. And I've, and I've seen it start to break out. Have you, have you seen it starting to break out among, amongst us that people that were, were you know, not necessarily on fire for God are getting on fire for God, and it's a wonderful thing to behold. And I believe it's going to happen more, and I want this atmosphere to be so charged in this place that, that an, uh, an unbeliever will not be able to walk out of this building still being an unbeliever. That a sick person will not be able to go home still sick that an addicted person will not be able to go home still addicted, but that we will be so full of revival, so full of the glory of God, that people's lives are changed when they walk into these doors. That's, what I, that's my heart's cry. That is my desire, is that we would, that we would, not, uh, that we would not just uh, you know, come together, but we would come together for a purpose. And that people wouldn't treat this house as a place where you come get an injection of the Holy Ghost. Like, whoo, man, that felt good. Now I can go, you know, live my life for another six months before I need another shot. But that people will be committed. And that we won't just have revival, we'll make disciples. Because that's what changes a community. Yeah. We're not riding a high, but walking with God. Yeah. Walking with God with great intimacy. Amen? Yeah. Amen. That's all I have for you tonight. Would you stand? Let's, let's pray together. And let's, let's ask God to forgive us. Let's ask God to forgive our land. And let's just expect God to do something that He's never done before, because I believe that's what He desires to do. Amen. Father, we thank You for who You are, and we thank You for all that You're doing in our midst. God, we thank You for things that transpired here Sunday morning, how people's lives were changed. The altar was filled with people receiving You into their life that people were delivered in their seats, there was healing taking place. But God, we believe there's so much more You want to do. And God, our nation needs revival. Our nation needs a reformation, a revolution of sorts. But God, we understand that the nation can't get on fire for God if we are not. So God, we're asking You to make us an epicenter of revival. May this place, may this house be a place that you choose to place your name here. May this house be a place, God, where the spirit of revival breaks out continually, perpetually. May this place be a place, God, where you are pleased by what we do. Send revival, God, not just to this house, but to each and every person hearing this Word online or in the building. Make each and every person a hub of revival. Let your fire burn deep down on the inside of us. We declare tonight that we are your people. We are called by your name. We are humbling ourselves tonight to say, God, forgive us. Hear us. Heal us tonight. Lord, we are declaring and we are decreeing tonight, God, that we belong to You. And Father, our nation is in desperate need of healing. Our nation is in desperate need of restoration. So Father, we pray tonight that You will move in ways that You've never moved before, that pockets of revival begin to break out throughout our nation, 
And that, God, that you will speak to people. That you will get a hold of their lives in Jesus' name. We, rep- we repent for the ungodliness of our nation. We repent for the wickedness of our nation. We repent, God, for things that we've done that has attacked the family unit. We repent, God, for, the, for leaving your side and leaving your will and living for ourselves. So we humble ourselves and we say, God, less of us and more of you. Less of us and more of you. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you because we do believe you are birthing revival. We believe that you are giving birth to a brand new move of God. And God, we just pray that it will start with us. That each and every person in this place tonight will begin to burn brightly with the fire of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before you go tonight, uh, a couple things we just want to uh, uh, make mention of. Uh, first and uh, foremost, everybody that gave towards a smoker, thank you so much. It means so much to, to us uh, leaders here at the church. And, uh, and come March, we're a fired up puppy up. Amen. Uh, secondly, if you brought tithes or offerings, uh, wanted to give towards anything, please uh, make sure that you drop it in the basket on your way out. And look out for a call from me in the next couple of days of some important items uh, that we need to just make everybody aware of. And uh, great, great things are happening here uh, at BFC. Amen? And then finally, uh, you know, invite somebody out Sunday. Let's get people out to the house because we're going to continue talking about hope. And we need hope. Amen? And so the the next two Sundays we're going to be talking about that. And so just encourage one another, love on one another, and be blessed tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.